Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the Biodiversity Podcast by Teasels. And for this uh, episode, I'm joined by Fergus Garrett from uh, Great Dixter House and Gardens. Hi, Fergus. How are you? Hello, Daniel. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Good stuff. Good, t- good stuff. Fergus, um, so as we were chatting earlier, I think um, some of the listeners will know who you are and where you work. Some won't. So do you want to give us a bit of a background on yourself and give us a bit of a background and an overview of um, Great Dixter House and Gardens? Yeah, okay. Um, Well, I'm the head gardener of Great Dixter. I've been here for over 20 years. I joined as head gardener in 1993. Um, I, I was born in Brighton, but brought up in Istanbul. I, my mother is Turkish and then fit, came back to, to the UK to finish schooling. And I was always been in, always been interested in, in, um, outdoor life really, but not, not, uh, not too much gardening. My grandmother was a really good gardener in Istanbul. So I think I carried those sort of genes on. Uh, I went to, um, to university to study agriculture first of all. I went to a place called Y College, which was part of London University. Um, But after a year of being an agri student, I decided it wasn't for me because it was all about production, production, production. I wanted to go and do a a more of a sort of rurally sensitive course, rural environmental studies, but my first year subjects didn't match. So they pushed me into doing horticulture. And I didn't really, I didn't even know what horticulture meant, actually. <laughs> That's when my tutor said, well, it's gardening. I thought, well, well my grandmother was a great gardener, so I'll, I'll give it a go. And luckily, I was inspired by um, a, a, a great man called Tom Wright, um, sadly no longer with us. Um, but he was the head of department for horticulture, amenity horticulture. And he was a sort of great unsung hero in in, in um in world horticulture actually and and it turned out to be that he was a student of Christopher Lloyd's when Christopher Lloyd taught at Y you know Christo was a student there in the 50s joined the teaching staff and Tom was one of his one of his students and so and there's the link we were joined you know we were Tom made sure I met Christo we became friends and and the rest is rest is history but um you know, so the, there was an, always an element of, of me interested in ecology and conservation because that was the course that I wanted to go into. But then I sort of lost myself in horticulture and it was all about being creative. It was all about knowing, you know, your botany, where plants are from and how to propagate them, how to use them, how to sort of underplant them, etc., whatever. And, and of course, along the way, you admired the birds and the butterflies that were part of that garden. But that was as, as, as far as it went, really. Yeah. So I, I, you know, once I left uni, I, I did a bit of work for the National Trust and did a bit of work for Brighton, Brighton Parks Department and so on, and, and then found my way to, to, to Dixter. And I worked alongside, you know, that great man, Christopher Lloyd, who was just an extraordinary character. Um, but he passed away in 2006 and I became... Can I stop you there, Fergus? Because that must have been, uh, to go from... To go from the parks departments at Brighton to to Great Dixter, that must have been a, a slight culture shock. Well, I, I took a big leap because I um I I I did actually go and work in sort of um, various private gardens as well, and and you know um, Br- Brighton was pretty early on in my in my career, but I loved it. I loved being part of the parks, you know, and that sort of initial parks training was was you know gave you real substance actually because we were doing everything from. And I met great people there as, as, as well. So that was good. But I think the important thing for me, Daniel, was that I, I had variety, you know, from private gardens in south of France to, to a garden in, in, in Switzerland to experiencing the climate in Turkey to, to, to doing a bit of chainsawing, a bit of coppicing, to doing, a, um, you know, uh, to, to turfing, to cutting the roadside verges along, you know, leading down to Brighton to... To all of those things, it was all experience which adds up to, to knowledge, which makes it easier to sort of um, to then step into a position at Dixter. And and I was, you know, I was pretty young when I got the head gardener's position at Dixter. Dixter. And and I never ever forgot that it was um, Christopher's garden. So he was head gardener, really. I was his assistant. And um, but then I I. As he aged, I did more and more and more, and 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 he was pretty good about sharing it all with me and bringing me along, you know. And mm-hmm. um, 
and we and above every, everything we were really good friends you know who's part of my family he was like a father figure like a grandfather figure he was my best friend for all those years as well and I was his closest friend as as, as well and and so we had a real lovely journey together lovely lovely so then so just going back so what age did what age were you uh, assistant head gardener under Christo? Oh, I, I must have been I, um, uh, 20, uh, in my 20s, 23, 24, something like that, 25. Wow. Yeah, so something. can you give um, so can you give a bit of uh, an overview of uh, the house and gardens? Because again, yeah. it, it's quite a special place. And for people that don't know what Great Dixter is, the link is below. So you can click on there and see um, see it. But yeah, could give us a bit of an overview of the house and gardens. I mean, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary place, and partly because of him, really, because he was such a quirky, unusual character. Um, he was sort of flouted all the rules and, you know, and and it was sort of had this swashbuckling style of gardening. But it's, it's based it's in East Sussex in the village of Northiam. It's, it's a 15th century manor house with a luchens wing attached to it and then there's a there's a sort of another 16th century yeoman's hall so it's a it's a grand house medieval manor house essentially with a luchens design garden around it so it's compartmentalized into a series of rooms so that you go from one new enclosed room to another with with sort of immense barns and host houses and those sort of things that are part of the infrastructure so it's got very very you know it's good bones a formal element that's the backbone of that of that garden and um, it's got topiary and all of that jazz as well. And it's got countryside around it. So, and what the Lloyds did is that they allowed the countryside to flow into the gardens. You know, they allowed the meadows to come into the garden, which was quite unusual. You know, I remember going there first time as a student and thinking, why on earth have they got long grass right up against the house? Because, you know, it sort of jarred from my sort of parks days where you sort of mowed things down. And I thought this is <laughs> unusual a bit you know surely it should be the other side of the fence etc all of that and I you know so how wrong I was of, of, of course but um and so I think they that was a lovely decision that they they allowed that countryside to flow in so there's this very nice ebb and flow of of of, of mother nature within 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 the garden um as well as that you know uh, he he was a very adventurous gardener. He um, wrote for Country Life. Christopher wrote for Country Life for over 40 years, a weekly article. He wrote various books, over 20 books, and he wrote other columns as well. And so um, because he was inquisitive, his writing fueled his gardening and his gardening fueled his writing. So it was this sort of, so he was always trying new things and he didn't want to, he didn't want to sort of be in the slow lane with anything at all. So and, and, and underlying all of this was very good scientific knowledge because he'd been taught well. Uh, so he understood the ecology of plants and he understood the um, uh, plant dynamics and communities and so on. So he could experiment with things and people would poo poo it. You know, they say, why on earth are you putting crying and power lie in the water? Surely that's a Mediterranean plant. And they would say that's a Mediterranean plant because it was almost sort of subtropical and, and, and it looked as though it belonged in a Mediterranean climate, but he'd seen it in the wild growing in a swamp you see in water so he'd plunge it in water at Dexter and it would survive and people would be shocked mm. by all of this so a lot of these, these experiments had you know that that science behind it so he's the way the word that, that you use there was this it was plant community so he's he I guess him as well as Beth Chatter were probably 40 years ahead of their time you know we're still using those same words now aren't we we're planting plant communities and you know and, and trying to recreate uh, you know, plants it from the wild. Sure, and of course they were great friends, um, Christo and Beth, and they always quarrelled over this right plant, <laughs> right place, because Beth would, was very strict about about this. And um, whereas Christo would say, "Well, it's not so clear cut as you think, Beth," and and Beth would say, "It is clear cut. Foxgloves are shade loving plants." And Christo would say, "No, they're abundant where coppice woodlands have been cut down. The light's been allowed in. They grow better, better mm -hmm. there. It's about the plant being happy. There's other elements. So, they did, I mean, they were they had the greatest amount of respect for each other." But they both believed in right plant, right place. So every gardener does, actually. I mean, because if you're trying to, you know, it's, it, otherwise it's an uphill struggle. The first thing is to make you sure that your plant is happy, yeah. you know. And so that's the that's the first thing. So, the, you know, um, 
I mean, both were extraordinarily creative people, but, but plant ecology was behind all their thinking. You know, if you sat Beth, Beth in a corner and said, what's the most important thing about a, um, a combination? And she'd say the plants, that the plants are happy. They're in the right place. Christo would say exactly the same thing as well. But of course, when he was asked that sort of question, he'd poo poo it and say, oh, you know, or shape or color or what, something like that. But, <laughs> But it underpinned all his, um, and he was actually, um, he was very much aware of the, the microcosm of life that existed in his garden as well. He was very much up on, he never used the biodiversity word, of course, nobody used it in those days, but he was very, um, he was very in tune with the birds and the butterflies and, and so on that was, and the fungi that was in his garden. Hmm. Interesting. I just got want to take you back a couple of steps. Did you were did uh, talking about um, Christo and Beth being very opinionated. Did uh, did uh, James Hitchmoff and Christo ever meet? Because I can just imagine a conversation between those two. They're very good friends, actually. Oh, excellent. Uh, James, when he first came over from Australia, because he was doing some work out there, he, he used to visit Dixter quite a lot. And because um, Christo was this rebel that James, you know, admired, mm. because Christo was already planting. Uh, uh, alien species in grass within his garden and experimenting things so they they really um hit it off those those two and and so we've got a long history with james you know we you know he's he's uh, he's brilliant in so many ways and and um it, and he's again somebody who backs his his the stuff that comes out of his mouth he backs it with science you know oh, he's, yeah. it's not just not it's not hot air or, or just stuff that's been made up he backs it and he and he's opinionated and controversial but he's a thinker and, he, and thank goodness we got you know we've we've got somebody like him uh, stirring things up yeah definitely definitely so um um so you know you, kind of your evolution where so you know you, you took on the head gardenership um sadly you took it over when well, you, you took it over when christo died in 2006 yeah. and i think it may be fair to say that you know your as a creative person that I know you are, you, you, you took it, um, the garden in a very creative way and you were thinking about color, form, texture, exuberant planting. And then would it be fair to say that you had an evolution where you became more and more and more aware that, um, you know, of the birds and the bees around? Yeah, because I mean, I, well, I, mean, I always, sorry, I always had a bit of that brain open, bit of my brain open to that. I, I think, um, the great thing with Christo was that he was so good about handing over to me. So gradually, as he aged, he let me take more and more of the sort of decision all round, as well as the creative decisions, you know. And then, um, and then I remember just before he died, just before he, he you know, he, he had a stroke and passed away. So unfortunately, just before his stroke, he said to me, it's, the place is yours now. He said, you know, I've done my bet, you know, I'm not. And I thought he was going to come out of hospital, actually. I thought he was going to, but he didn't survive it. And so for me, the most important thing was to, to protect Dixter and to save it because he didn't own all of it. So we had to sort of um, raise money to, to, to purchase the bits that we didn't. Have. So that was that came to the fore. Then it was important not to 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 lose the essence of what it was. And it was a highly, highly creative um, garden. You know, it's dynamic, fast moving, experimental, all of that. And of course, you have to do that for the right reason, for the sake a bit of you learning rather than it's just being a show-off thing for the so that we got embroiled in all of that sort of sort of stuff and then we sort of put our efforts into education as well and all, all of that you know my my wife's an ecologist and she she works for um, the zoological society of london dealing with all sort of sort of issues and she's um and and i was very aware of this because i because her all her friends are are involved in conservation projects and and and, and so on and and so and she would always be badgering me you know because i'd see some interesting butterfly or i'd see something or she'd go and sort of find a beetle and she'd say you know you, you ought to do a biodiversity audit in the in the garden and i just didn't even know what that you know what that was and i just thought oh you know what you, what you, what you're talking about because we've got great meadows we're dripping with orchids we've got adder's tongue ferns we've um, you know we've got great crested newts galore there are you know lesser spotted greater spotted woodpeckers that i'm seeing you know so we've got loads of badgers 
we're doing the right thing and we, we sort of pat each other on up <laughs> in the back saying oh we've seen another rare rare such and such and all that she said it's not about that you know she said it's about it's about getting information out into the community so you should be feeding information into the local records and working together with other organizers to, 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 and and you know because there is a lot going on and Dexter and and so to, to actually find out exactly what's there will mean that you can then manage it properly because you know Daniel what we were doing is that I was creating another meadow uh, and and an orchid rich meadow and 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 she was saying to me well do you need to create another bit of meadow there is that the best habitat is that the habitat you're you're lacking there is there should should there be something else and when the penny dropped was this you know I wanted to I was using a um, there was a kid who who had just um, helping us and I wanted him to, to have a project so I, I, he wanted to build a shed and I thought fine you know because we do a lot for the community mm -hmm. yeah so I said yeah go ahead and I, I like to have a green roof on on that shed so I was going to put sort of sedums and sempervirens and all those sort of things and I remember going to Amanda and saying what sort of plants should I use to um to put on the green roof and she said well you've got plants everywhere she said but what thing you haven't got is bare soil she said, you haven't got you much bare soil. Oh, you can't say bare soil. Yeah, she like said, you know, she said, because that's what I, she said, why don't you, you know, and I said, well, we have got bare soil. We better actually, okay, look about, think about what I'm saying. Think about habitats, you know, creating another habitat, you know. So, so why don't you experiment and just put in bare soil? So we did, we put bare soil in there. And it was just swimming with all sorts of stuff that were nesting in there. So, you know, she thought about it in another level, much bigger, bigger, bigger level. And so, but I, I ignored her for a few years thinking, oh, you know, she'd say, get her audit done. I'd say, oh, we've seen another kingfisher or something like that. She said, oh, she'd, she'd be sort of holding her head in her hands. <laughs> but then I, I thought, you know, we we got we managed to sort of keep the name of Dixter going and um, with the trustees and and a very cohesive group that are just wanting to do good out of this place. And I felt we we're going in the right direction. But I felt that one thing we hadn't done is protected the the wider estate around us because we've got ancient woodlands and meadowland. And I thought, well, I what I'd like to do is do a survey of the wildlife in those areas. OK, mm -hmm. so I went to the HLF. And which have been, you know, the Heritage Lottery Fund have been an extraordinarily supporting organization for us and other, other, other people. And so, and I said, I want to do an audit in the wild, on the wild land that's around us. And they said, and so I filled out the sort of necessary forms, filled out, and they gave us money to, to, to actually get the experts in to look at the land around us. But we decided to include the garden in as well. Mm -hmm. And thinking that the garden is going to be the poorest part of the old estate because we've got all this meadowland beyond the garden. We've got all these ancient woodlands that are managed in a sort of, in a sort of effective way. And so we had, we had, whether it's a, a moth specialist or lepidopterist or, or a bryologist or whether it's, you know, entomologist um, galore or somebody who's keen on fungi or lichens or whatever. All these people were on us and they're looking at the whole estate, walking around the whole, the, the whole estate. And we loved having, having them here, really. Uh, absolutely loved it. And, um, but the, the outstanding results were that the garden was rich as anything else out there, if not richer. You know, that was the, the in, in terms, it, we thought that it'd be, it'd be all coming from the outside into the garden. And this sort of lead ecologist said, actually, it's, I think it's going from the garden out. You know, that's how rich you are. You could be a treble SI if you wanted to. You should be a local nature reserve or a wildlife um, spot. She said, you are that rich. Now, interesting, because when, um, when I was on this journey, before I sort of did the, the full blown out, audit i um i tried to get some experts in to just to look at some i tried to get the british arachnological society in to look at spiders here and mm. they wrote a very interesting note back to me saying that really they're not keen on visiting gardens because they usually find that they're relatively sterile places okay that's a yeah because this is a few years back though. yeah surprise, that surprises me because you know that if you if you can if you look at the amount of diversity that that forms a lot of uh, forms a lot of residential you know residential gardens public gardens like yours sure i think i think it's it's probably because they they went a to the wrong sort of garden that's probably had the 
the the life sprayed out of it perhaps i don't know or they it was just their idea of what a garden because it's full of non-native species that that it may be that they're looking at it that that way around so i i was really rather put out by this so i i wrote back to them and said why don't you come and use the the one of the halls as as a place to have your annual general meeting you don't need to survey the garden you can just have your meeting because we like being with you you know your groups people and and so they came and they went out and had a look at the compost heap at lunchtime when they went to sort of have a bit of fresh air and I think they found, I don't know how many dozens of species of spider on there. They found a rare spider or by the horse pond. They found another one that's only found in three other places on a, on a, um, on top of a, um, a gate post. And they found something that hadn't been recorded since the early part of the century or something like that. Or last, you know, wow. so they found all these extraordinary stuff within during their lunch break. And then they said to me we really would like to come back again. And we've got some other friends who are, who are, you know, who are, um, will look at moths and butterflies and so on. They may find this place quite interesting. Mm. And, and, and then they came back and they found, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of species of spiders. And, and that really then fueled my, energy even more and that's at that point i went to the hlf and said can we you know how about this how about doing a survey the garden is rich but the outside has got to be even richer you know richer than this but it turned out that you know and of course it's wrong to say one part is richer than the other daniel because it all sort of feeds in sort of it flows from one to another and it doesn't mean because only five species are found in one part of the garden that's not as important as another part that's got 20 species in it because those five species may be really terribly terribly important you know mm -hmm. so 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 um but they said when we did a heat map of the garden the majority of the species count were coming out of the garden itself because of, like you say, the diversity, the diversity of food sources, the diversity of habitats, you know. Um, the and, I guess the and I guess the, the structure, the structure of the planting, the structures as in the old Lutchin's house that it's, you know, that it's got the it's got the cavities. So it's the structure of the plant, the structure of the house, the interconnectedness of the planting itself. I guess that's that forms part of it as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think structures were really structure is a really good word actually, and, and people think it's just because of food that they're here, but they need a place to live as well. You see, so that so so the fact that the the building the buildings and the roofs and the structures were relatively porous to insects i don't mean porous that they let in weather but yeah. porous to insects there were little nooks and crannies and that can be mimicked in a in a modern building quite easily like that with yeah. with sort of bricks that are like insect hotels or whatever you know so the building had eaves that birds could nest under they had the insects there and what happens is that the more you have there the more comes because mm. it's part of that web and that's, that's a food chain, isn't it? So the diversity of structures, um, the diversity of habitats and the diversity of, of, of practices, you know, from sh shrubberies and trees that are not engaged with much as a gardener to those areas that are bedded out maybe twice or three times a year. So you may think, well, those areas that we are handling and, and disturbing well, they'll be the most sterile areas, but they're important for certain things. You know, they, they as our ecologist, and I said to the ecologist, this guy called Andy Phillips, he's our lead ecologist, I said to him, you try and see it through a gardener's eye, because that, it's no good you concentrating on the ancient woodland, because not many people have got ancient woodland, you know, so I want you to see, a look at the garden, look at why this garden is so rich, and he said, well, it's interesting, he said, because I never thought of it like this, but the fact that you're turning over soil, is almost like, you know, the species that we're finding there, the sort of species that we find were in those sort of brownfield sites and cities, yeah. but also where cliffs have collapsed as well. And, and he said, and it's interesting, you know, if you go to Nep where they rewilded and it's very, you've got, you've got robins that are following the, the pigs around because the pigs are disturbing the soil. Well, robins follow gardeners around. It's the same sort of same system as that. <laughs> Yeah. So we started connecting the things that we were doing. So those diversity of activities um, was very important. And of course, what's so terrific about Dixter is that we've got a long season of, 
of food plants, you mm. know, it's because we practice this succession, this multi-layer planting, which mimics what happens in the in the in the wild, you know, whether it's bluebells, wooden enemies, followed by you know the um, the red campion, followed by foxgloves and the trees. Well, we do that to an extreme within the garden. So that allows, that means that there's a long season of food there as well and a diverse season of food. So have you got, have you got, I, I have, you, have you got stuff in flower most of the year? I'm sure. Most of the year, absolutely, we have, absolutely. Yeah, because um, some areas have got seven layers in them. Yes. So that's, you know, so you've got, you've got, you know, um, I mean, Dixter's small, but still it's effective. We got, we got flowers. And that was the great thing about um, it being Christopher's private home because he didn't just garden for the open season, which was for essentially from April to October. He gardened all year round because he wanted to see winter flowers. And, mm. and so, so we've got, you know, we've got things in flower all year round to here and, and very effective too. And I think so, so that length of season also, the fact that when Christopher died, now he was of a different generation, and he was quite happy to use sprays. He didn't see anything wrong with it. He loved wildlife, but he was, but he was happy. That, happy. Inter that interests me. That that he's, well, he's, he was obviously a bright man. He must have known that they had they were having an impact. Yeah, uh, yeah, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. And I think, don't get me wrong, he was sensitive in the way that he used them. You know, so he would he wouldn't you know if there were sort of bees over uh, um, his fuchsia bush, he wouldn't go and spray that with a uh, pesticide because of caps, um, because of the capsid bugs in there or whatever. But nonetheless, he used them. You know, he nonetheless he was in favour of using Roundup and those sort of things because he thought that's the modern practice that you've got to do that. And he thought that the good he was doing in creating this 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 magic garden outweighed the bad he was doing by. Spraying by spraying it so that he thought that it was it was a it, it was bad. whereas when he died uh, well while he was alive i used less and less and less anyway um of sprays um but we would still you know we would still spray one or two things but when he died i stopped spraying and and i let things go a bit wilder as well the edges of the car parks go and and you know that that raised a few eyebrows including from our own staff as well you know, I've got some very supportive people here, but one or two people thought, whoa, what are we doing not, not spraying because we're going to have pest A, pest B, pest C, and so on. And it was just magic, really, because the first year was a roller coaster ride. <laughs> the second year got easier. Third year, now we don't even think once about whether we've got a pest or not. They're just not here. There seems to be this wonderful balance in the garden. We don't even have to worry about it. And there, of course, there's an element of, of if something is really susceptible to um, powdery mildew or whatever it is, we don't, we just don't grow it. We just don't grow it. But we, 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 we function with a highly ornamental garden that's open to the public with, um, without spraying and it's perfectly all right. And we're so rich. I mean, we, uh, uh, we've got a, if you think there's 280 species of bee in the UK, we've got a, over 130 species so we're near enough half the uk species count on bees now it's not it's not like my my wife says it's not about you know ticking off it's not like stamp collecting it's about numbers as well it's about biomass it's about numbers of that in order to sustain populations but um but the fact that they're here is really terrific and the fact that they're in the garden was ter terrific yeah because what you were mentioning earlier is basically you've got the biological controls on site haven't you you you're all the pests have a have a predator, and you are you are, because again, it, I guess some people, um, you know, some people fail to realise that when you're spraying off a pest, I'm broadly speaking now, spray off a pest, that you also kill the beneficial insects off as well, and it's you're absolutely right in that, Daniel. That's just and that's been pointed out to me over and over again. You know, we used to we used to worry about the water lily beetle in the water lilies, and you know, Christo and I used to scratch our head. What should we do with this? What should we do with, do with this? Well, we just left it, and they they they're gone. You know, because the pests, the the, the predators found them. Yeah. You know, there's the, there's the balance there. You know, sometimes things get slightly out of kilter, but it doesn't matter. It balances itself out quite well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pausing because it's it's trying to relinquish that control because perhaps you could have, one could have lost their nerve after year one and gone, no, 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 we must spray because of this, this and this outbreak. And it's about holding your nerve, isn't it? Holding your nerve, allowing the numbers, allowing the biomass to build up. So, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, so I, suppose I mean, we're a high profile garden and we're under a sort of the, the lens all the time, you know, the microscopes, under the microscope. But um, I suppose, it, it's easier at Dixter because we're slightly wildish anyway, yeah. you know. So that fact that that you know, whereas if if you know if it was done in a sort of high end national trust garden and so on, their audience is slightly different and they may object more. And I did we we get objections to meadows not being cut, etc. And all all of that we get people writing in letters all the, all the time. And I you know when I was allowing and I was mixing in some other sort of native species in with our borders like cow parsley and those sort of things and i got letters and photographs from people with their pointing to a cow parsley and saying <laughs> hey, is this you know the photograph with these hands pointing oh. in saying why is this weed in the borders what are you doing like this and that you know so there's an element and you have to hold your nerve and mm -hmm. say i believe in this and i'm doing this for a reason you know it's, it's, it's about being brave with it and then going in the head and and all our we were fueled right the way through from all the fun but can i stop you there it's so interesting though that you know you somebody sees a cow parsley and faints but somebody sees you know a bought umbelifa and we all fall over and it's oh it's so amazing you know and it's it's it, as you're talking i'm just thinking we as humans put labels on what's good or what's bad or what should be there and shouldn't be there and it's it's crazy it's, it's crazy isn't it yeah because um uh, I, and I said this to some of the gangs, if this cow parsley was some rare umble from Chile, we'd be all <laughs> clambering to get hold of it like this. And it's perfectly, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly good as, a, as an ornamental plant. Now we don't, um, so I've left certain things because of their wildlife value, not just because they're ornamental, you know. Um, I mean, I like dandelions, so, so it's not difficult to leave leave those, but there are one or two areas where I left nettles, not in the garden outside the, outside the garden or in these sort of quiet corners um, because they're so beneficial to it. But I, I think that's the extent that we've gone to. We haven't really changed the way we do things at all. And, and um, I mean, we've liked umbels a lot and alliums a lot, and they they support a wide range of insects anyway. Um, but it's about people's attitudes, isn't it? But the fact that that we were being egged on by the entomologist, mm. fuel, you know, just supported us right the way through. And the fact that when all these sort of figures came out of all the species that were here, um, it was and people were just you know aghast because there were so many species. That gave us even more confidence to, to carry on as as we were as we were doing. I mean, they in one year's reporting that analysis, they found over two thousand six hundred species, or something at, at, at Dixter, something extraordinary like that. Which is, you know, it, which, and and some of them, quite rare species that are under threat. And, and one thing that's because I was reading through the um, the biodiversity audit um, the other day, and if you want to read it. It's in the notes uh, below the video uh, that even in um, where was it? So you even the Great Barn, the North Barn and near the log piles, which is not a massive area. Yeah. What was it? 40, 40 different bee species, 20 different parasoid wasps as well. Yeah. And, and again, that really stuck with me because, again, people may go onto the website and think, well, that's a massive garden. But yeah. On your scale of, 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 you know, by the barns, it, it's totally achievable, perhaps in a, in, a, you know, in a domestic smaller garden, isn't it? Yeah, and also what you've got to realise is that, you know, um, when you, they don't, you don't have to have a, just your small space will have impact because if, if you're talking about flying insects or say insects in general, from one garden to another, they could be a series of stepping stones throughout the town and city that will yeah. all add up to a bigger space. And with the fact that we all garden differently will mean that there's, there'll be even more diversity in the structure that's that's there. And I think, I mean, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing new in this because Jennifer Owen did the studies all those years ago in her sort of Leicestershire garden where she found 2,600 species in a, in a relatively small garden. 
yeah and 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 um so and hers was an ornamental garden as as well you know slightly on the wild side but ornamental as well so and and people i, find I do hope her book is still is still in print because that is a that's a like a blueprint not a blueprint but that's amazing you know that uh, that her garden and that um, sometimes can get lost in a lot of the literature, actually. And, so. and what happens is, is, and the sad thing is, is, is that um, so, somebody who's amazing like her and the studies that she, she did, that, that her voice will not always be heard or mm. recognised. But then it sort of, so we do a little study at Dixter, which is a prestigious garden with a name, and then we get, you know, we get heard. But actually, that there are unsung heroes there, like Jennifer Owen and and Chris Baines and all those people, all those years. And there are people out there, all those ecologists and all those um, conservationists that 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 sort of sort of shouted about this for 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 years. And I think the the world is waking up to it as well because there's been some drastic loss of biodiversity out there. But um, uh, but you've those people should get the recognition for all the work that they did. They're, they're the pioneers in all of this. And talking of recognition, I can't get this through this podcast without talking about our mutual, uh, mutual contact in John Little. Yes. And he was talking about, talk, cause you talk about recognition that he was, he was, um, you know, uh, you know, really going on talking about brownfield landscapes, talking about how we can recolonize road verges Cool. And he went on about it and on about it, and he lost his battle with the A13 um, uh, road extension. But I don't know if you saw that the uh, highways agency have put into their into their policies that they are going to actively promote biodiversity uh, and meadows and create meadows by the side of the road. So it's you know it takes a long time, but the message is getting out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John John's voice should be heard. Yeah, absolutely. And and so you don't want you know, a prestigious gardener to, to, to just their voice to, to, to be, to be heard. You, you've got, there's so many people out there doing really good, good things, whether it's, um, you know, I don't know if you, Richard Scott of Land Life used to be at Land Life International now. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, he's, so he's done amazing work in his, in his, in his time. You know? And, and so you've got all of those people out there John Little has done and continues to do really interesting stuff as well. And it's not just his biodiversity stuff, just the way he managed that Clapton estate, you know, so uh, in, in London, that was an unusual. And, and people will be looking at that in years to times, in years to come and say, that's a real model for how we should be managing those estates. And, and there. so, um, I mean, he's, he's, he certainly should have a platform that, that, that guy. And, and um, so, I think all t together, I think ecologists and gardeners are going to work closer together. Everybody's got to work closer together to make things happen. And we can make things happen, happen in towns and cities because, you know, all those little gardens will add up to something. All those roadside verges will add up to something. All of those green spaces and brownfield sites will add up to something. And all of that is out of the food production zone, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't have to, you know, uh, of, of course we should... Um, we should produce food differently as as well to make it to make a difference, you know. And I think we've got to wake up to all of this stuff. Because in a way, he's drawing a parallel between the interconnectedness of I've got it, the mosaic of different habitats you've got at Dixter, but it's that interconnectedness. We do have to have gardeners. We do have to have politicians. We do have to have ecologists, entomologists, all work all working as one. And I, and I and planners. B builders, planners, architects, landscape architects, volunteer groups, you know, the community leaders, whether they're sort of religious community leaders, all of those um, people have got to work. We're going to have the will to work together, the will to work together, and they can, they can then make things happen. Yeah, and I feel that, you know, there is, well, it's perhaps worth, hopefully it's going to be worth the paper that's written on, but there's legislation coming out now with biodiversity net gain, that you know within all of this sort of uh you know the development framework that they have to show a, a, a net gain a biodiversity net gain with with all these developments so it, it, it is it is moving in the it is moving in the right direction sure it, sh it should do. i mean it's so easy it would be so easy to to actually um as part of the planning process is to put sort of various rules in to, to when you do new builds you know and um 
and it would also be so easy to to um, to do these surveys within towns and cities. That's what we're trying to encourage around here with all the villages and towns around us that they do um, biodiversity audits. And we're getting villages doing it around us. They do an audit to find out what's in what's in, what's happening, what's in the land around them. They're looking at the local. Um, local records as well and then they're tweaking the way they manage all, all, all of this because you know so, so often what happens is that um they put a they they develop one little bit, bit of roadside verge and put a sort of flower mark on it to say this is special yeah. they, and they feel they've done their bit because they're protecting of course it's great that they're protecting that bit of grassland but actually they're not thinking about the hedges they're not thinking about the scrappy bits of land they're not thinking about how the buildings can um, can do something as, as well. They're not thinking about ev how every space can matter in, yeah. in this. And I think, so uh, I think, and, and there are a lot of care caring people out there within these communities, but what they need is the extra bit of information, uh, education, so that they can actually act act in the right in the right way. So, and, and that, we're, we're doing a bit of that at Dexter, where we're going out and speaking to people about, about how it's not just about the little bit of roadside verge in the village. It's about the whole of the village. And so, if you get an ecologist involved, mm -hmm. uh, that will does a, as you know a, a, an audit. Something interesting may come out of that. And I feel that as a sort of another layer to that as well, that technology can help us because there's a lot of um, citizen science as well, where people you know there, there's the apps and the technology there where you can take a photograph of of a wildflower or a or a bee or whatever it may be and then that feeds into a database and then that feeds into the wider scientific data that is used for used for decision making that's right and that's really so everybody can play their part you know we we talk about dexter being a big garden and of course we're privileged to be in there but that person with even a small front garden can play their part mm. um, and because it will all add up and it's that sort of that that movement as well you know that sort of um and we we were it was interesting we had a rural conference in the rother area and that was uh, put together um by um the local authorities and that was just so so great because we talked about meadows the importance of 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 verges verge management mm. to all the local parishioners and all the sort of um local people and to to um to town councillors and, and and so on and so there's a lot of influential influential people there but to actually talk to have that audience in front of you where you know that some of them some of those people are the decision makers mm. um was magic because you thought actually finally things are being done about about this um, that. That was, so that was sorry. That was a rural conference. Remind me. Yes, what so it was. It was. It was organised by um, our local M MP, who said to me, uh, you know, years ago, he said to me, "Is there anything, you know, you, you'd want us to do that you see we should be doing differently?" Of course, there are many things, but I said, "Well, actually, one thing would be to, for you to cut your roadside verges um, less." And he said, uh, and I, and he said, oh, "Yes, but only people objected." I said, "Well, why don't you get a load of people here from?" Um, from parish councillors to to local councillors, and I can actually talk to them about why the reason we should be cutting our verges less as well. So many years ago, so um, uh, this, so this was Hugh Merriman who did this, and he got people in, and we did talk about it. And from there, there was a knock-on effect where they wanted to have, uh, in conjunction with Sussex Wildlife Trust, they wanted to get all the parish councillors into a Zoom meeting where we could actually talk. Me and um, Keith Batchelor, who's, who's a sort of very uh, forward thinking person on, on, um, on Meadows. He's done a lot of Meadow work. So, um, and so where we could talk about the importance of, of treating roadside verges in a certain way. And, and the message wasn't, you know, don't cut them. Of course you need to cut certain areas, but to think about the mosaic system and to think, don't cut the bits that don't need cutting. Think about woodland edge effects as well. So think yeah. about biodiversity. Think about working alongside um, county ecologists and and the, the wildlife trusts and with village conservation bodies. About it's about it was about bringing all those people in together, and that's been so successful. That whole thing, 
and sort of East Sussex County Council were there as, as well. So, and, and we as a garden were there as, as, as well. Um, and, um, and the other important message out of that, Daniel, was that um, when we did our biodiversity audit, we had two fields next to each other. We had one field that had loads and loads of orchids on it. There was just this picture po postcard of what you'd imagine this, this wonderful meadow to be. The other field had little patches of nettles, bits of hogweed in there, had brambles in the corner and, and so on. And it's where our plant fairs are held. And that field, which was the scrappy field that didn't have, that wasn't dripping with orchids, had so many more species than the other one. Because it had, and you said it had the structures in there, the different structures. So it's about perhaps embracing those bits of grassland that haven't got an orchid on them, those mediocre meadows or those poorer areas, because each one of those spaces is a habitat. You know, so so don't just protect the bits that sort of, that have got orchids or a rare wild plant on it. Of course, protect those, but protect the other bits of ground as well, and don't cut things unnecessarily. So that was the message. It's getting that, like you've said that twice now. Like you you've just said it then, and your wife said it to you earlier that about you know you look at it as a habitat. You know, it's you know a meadow is not the only place. Where you can have wildlife, you know, it, it is looking at everything not as as a as a habitat, yeah. and and again, that's part of it. That's that mosaic habitat, especially with Dixter, where you have, like you said earlier, you have the bedding which you're turning over yeah. three times a year next to a next to a, a porous um, granite granite wall, sure. ne next to cut grass, next to meadow, next to a log pile. That interconnectedness, which is. Uh, absolutely, and that's that's possible in a in a in a town because I show a picture of Dexter with this old historic house and the the flower rich borders and the and the paving and the short grass and the meadows and the long grass and then I show a housing estate in in Hastings which has got the same. The buildings aren't porous, but they could be made porous by having the right sort of insect bricks and so on on there and swift um, nests and so yeah. on. And I show the the mown grass. I show the the paving. I show that the the, uh, the, the the long grass and then it's just the same you know it's just mm -hmm. and the rich borders that Dixter have got well that can be people's gardens that will all add up to something so there's nothing nothing different that the, the both you know can sort of move into each other so it's it's out there for us to for us to do but I think I think guiding people is very important people are nervous as well they're nervous that that a wildlife and that's why it was interesting for us to be involved because they think that a wildlife garden they're, they're thinking, oh, it's just going to be a bramble patch. That's what they're thinking. Or it's going to be a nettle patch. So if you can show them that an ornamental garden can have a wildlife value, okay, that's one thing, then that's a great thing. If you can also show them or teach them that something that's wild and a weed like cow parsley is as beautiful as an ornamental plant, that's, you know, that's another thing, you see. So gardens can serve this purpose. Of, of just forming a link because it's no good preaching to the people who already go to uh, nature reserves and those sort of, because they're already they've already converted so you want to try and convert the people who look at a bit of meadow and say wow that's a mess okay you're not going to convert everybody but I, I remember the topiary lawn um there were two there were two bikers there actually um uh, they were holding hands and looking at they had their motorcycle helmets in the other hand they looked at this and they went whoa like this and i thought oh here we go there's gonna be a criticism here and the and the guy said to the lady whoa that's what i call a lawn let's do this and i thought that's great oh. really you know i mean it just turned out to be that they were, they were bikers but it's just having that sort of reaction to 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 something that supports life. I guess what, what comes to mind when you're saying that is I think as, 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 as people that have gardens, people that design gardens, it's about getting that edge as well. Cause we've, we've, we've talked about this in the past where the edge to give a meadow some structure or give it, uh, give it carte blanche to do it what it needs. It needs that edge, doesn't it? It needs a, a sharp edge so you get that delineation between i mean it's the same old thing it's the mass and void isn't it yeah and but you feel you know so it, it, again this is where our entomologist was really quite interesting he said you need that edge not for just for the design side of it but actually they 
a lot of things need short grass in order to nest in, in, yeah. in, in the soil. And if it's all long, 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 it's all the same structure. Whereas the short grass gives you a different structure. Like you say, it creates that mosaic habit. So you need bits of bare ground, you need short grass, you need long grass, then you need the woodland edge and so on. And you know, you need the whole variety, mm. um, which is, um, so a garden does that. And so I said to him, so are there rules we should lay down? And he said, no, I think you don't lay down too many rules because the fact that people do their own things um, will create that perfect storm because you'll get even more diversity as a, as a result of it. Of course, you may lay down one or two rules um, that are benefit, like don't spray and, and allow, don't close up every little cavity in your wall, you know, and, and sort of finish it off with cement, allow certain places for things to, to nest, don't cut down everything and tidy it away all the time. You know, there are little rules um, that you can lay down like that, but not everybody has to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can just, you know, do you, somebody does a little bit of something, but you know, not everybody likes brown structures. So if you don't like it, cut it down, you know, but, but your neighbor may like your teasel seed heads and so on that, that are of great value. And, 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 and if they keep your teas, if they keep, then, you know, it all adds up to something. You create that diversity. They don't have a choice whether they like the seeds because they're from my front garden and their, their once perfect lawn now has teasels, um, echiums, uh, Indian teasels. So they don't really have a choice. But there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think so many, so much of our, you see some of those design spaces. So landscape architects are to, to blame as well as, as anybody else. But they're so sterile, those spaces, you know, that's, you know, they're so clinically finished off. There's no thought. So I think it's just having, so having your, your, from that design process, it's right from the start, having, your mind open to creating a habitat or allowing a food source, you know, or creating a food source for something. Mm. And there's some brilliant work going on with some of these landscape architects that are just very open to this, very aware, and not just aware about biodiversity, but aware that it has to be done in the public realm, but also aware that it can mitigate floods and all of these sort of things. You know, um, you just look at the Greater Green Scheme in Sheffield, for instance, and that's been a real success, isn't it? Yeah, I know it has been a real success. And I, I know the people that are actually working on um, Nigel Dunnett's work at the Barbican and, yeah. and within the City of London that are actually on the ground, actually maintaining it. And yeah, it's... Um, you know, he's done brilliant stuff, Nigel has, really has. And 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 he's and he's got his practical head on as well, because you know, those sort of in those public spaces, you can't garden it like Dixter. You don't haven't got the sort of manpower to do it, but you can he can still do complex plantings that are as showy as Dixter, but do them that that are relatively low maintenance compared to what um um Dixter is. Yeah. And a low low maintenance and low input as well. That's right. Yes. Oh, low, right. Yeah. Yeah, but the industry's got a long way to go. Um, but I think as long as people are aware, I think that this sort of new generation are really sort of making changes and thinking about everything. They're thinking about everything, everything from, from diversity to sustainability to biodiversity. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's a really positive thing. So Fergus, I feel that's, uh, that's, I don't think we can better that. So uh, I think that's a no lovely way to, uh, to a lovely note to leave it on. So, um, Fergus, you, like with all guests, do you want to just let people know where um, they can find you, or are you a are you a social media type person? Yes, I'm on, I'm on Instagram, but um, um, I don't even know what my Instagram is. So I'll tell you what what it is. Hold on, I can find find that. Um, so I am Fergus Fergus Mustafa Sabri Garrett at on Instagram. I think fantastic. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Fergus Mustafa Sabri, Fergus Mustafa Sabri Garrett, all one word on Instagram. So they can see, you know, it's my own. And, and of course, there's Great Dixter Official as, as well. So they can find. So um, my one is all the quirky experiments that we do at Dixter. The Great Dixter one has the information, but they can find us on the Dixter website as, as, as well. So, you know, they'll know where we are. Of course. Excellent. Yeah. Fergus. 
you're a star for doing this. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your knowledge. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Daniel. Nice to speak to you again. See you. Bye. Bye bye. Oh, it's gone.